American Family Association um, due to my involvement in a television show called Currently Speaking on PBS. Um, at that time, the show was very fair and very balanced and very equal um, and had many different points of view represented. Today, if you take a, a chance actually <laughs> to watch it at all, it's become very liberal and very progressive. Um, but when I was there, we had the opportunity to discuss a myriad of political and social topics, and we had Gary come on and speak a number of times on abortion, gay marriage, creation versus evolution, and probably three or four that I've forgotten since then, um, because that was two years ago. Um, the reason I've been chosen, I guess, to introduce Gary, um, just to give you kind of a background from my perspective and, and having worked with Gary, He's a man of integrity and strong character, and that's why I've had him on the show so many times, and that's why I've chosen to support him in his race for U.S. Senate. Um, and so with that, I'll give you Mr. Lynn.
addresses, locations, and times of over 2,000 Tea Party rallies across America. Now, they don't get a lot of credit. There's going to be a book coming out called The Tea Evangelical. I don't think even AFA realized how much of a role it played in the launch of the Tea Party movement. But I'm certainly gratified to be associated with an organization that from the very beginning played an integral role in launching this great wave of patriotism that I think has brought our country back from the roof. So again, thank you. And I'm here tonight not to ask you as a politician from outside for your support, but as a fellow Tea Party to ask for your support. I'm not just asking for your support in the Republican nomination for the United States Senate. I'm here to respectfully submit my application for membership in the Tea Party Caucus of the United States Senate. If I'm elected your next U.S. Senator and nobody else joins, you can be guaranteed that I will be the fifth member of the Tea Party Caucus. I'm surprised there's only four of them there. But the very first news release I put out, I said I would join Jim Bennett and Mike Lee and Rand Paul and Ron John. those four have been willing to do, and it's proven it, is that they're willing to stand up to Mitch McConnell and Republican leadership as quickly as they do to Harry Reid and Democratic leadership. We've got to change the culture for which the leadership of both parties have been responsible. That's why it's not just enough to elect Republicans. Well, I assume you're here tonight because you love your country, you love liberty. I think that's something the Lord writes on your heart, even at a young age. Sometimes it's called the remnant. You know, those who may be busy trying to raise a family and make a living, maybe hadn't paid as much attention, but then finally something woke you up. And what was written on your heart many years before, maybe even as a child, forced you to be sitting in these chairs tonight. Let me tell you a brief little story about that. When I was nine years old in the fourth grade, we went on our elementary school field trip to a greenhouse. And they gave every kid a plant to take home. And at the end of the meeting, the guy said, now what we want you to do is take this plant, take it home, plant it, and we want to know next year when you come back who was able to keep their plants alive. I don't know if anybody else cares. I do distinctly remember thinking to myself, if nobody else keeps that thing alive, I'm going to keep mine alive so I can come back here next year and practice. We got back to the school and the teacher announced that she was going to put it to a majority vote of all the kids in the class of whether or not to take our plants and donate them to be planted in front of the principal's office. I made a technical appeal. I said the bus students who came back and forth on buses had already left. It would be fair to vote without them. She blew that off. Of course, <laughs> instinctively, I recognized this, being nine years old, as an attempt by the collective to use the pyramid of majority to seize my private property. <laughs> <laughs> None of the other kids cared. They all voted to give them to the principal. So my girlfriend and I, we suggested, went down to the principal's office afterwards, and we thought it was entirely reasonable to go to the principal, Mr. Caldwell, and say, Mr. Caldwell, Lisa and I would like to have our plan. Now, this guy ended up being a high school football referee, so I saw him throughout the rest of my scholastic you know, career. I'd see him on the football field, et cetera, you his son. But I was only nine years old, and I remember this grown man leaning over, pointing at me with a red face, saying, if that's the way you feel about it, we'll make all the kids take their plan. I just said, yes, sir. I was thinking to myself, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but if that's what you want to do. That's fine by me. I just want mom. <laughs> Next morning, the teacher got up and she said the Pledge of Allegiance. And then she said, now, class, I want to tell you about a concept called majority rule. And I saw it coming, so I kind of rolled my eyes and just say how old I am. She said, but you can't any more of that. I'm each in the hall of the power. They can actually power you and roll in your eye. It's being disrespectful. She gave us our lecture. Bottom line, I got my plan. I maintained ownership of my private property. And you remember those exhaust things that used to come out of the house where the dryer was? I figured, here's my secret. I'm going to plant it right under that exhaust. It'll keep it alive during the winter. I'll be able to brag next year I kept that thing alive. So I did. About three days later, it was burnt to a crisp. <laughs> but in the free market, in a capitalist system, while I have the right to make mistakes and learn from my mistakes, the bottom line was, somewhere in my heart, I knew it was wrong for an arm of the government to seize my private property to which I'd already taken the challenge to my heart. So I think the Lord puts that love of liberty into your heart whether you know it or not. I think it's reasonable to ask anybody standing up here asking for your support, why are they running for the United States Senate? Have they lost their mind? 
I was in Washington about two weeks ago and had a very sober realization that if I win, I have to go there. <laughs> and I don't get to get on a plane and leave real quick. And it's not Midland, Michigan. And it's not Bassett. So it would be a sacrifice for my family. I've still got young children. It would be a sacrifice for my family. It would be disruptive to our lives if I actually won. So why would you do something like that? In searching my heart for the answer, I can just truthfully tell you the answer I came up with. Let me put it like this. I was raised by a World War II Marine who survived the attack on Pearl Harbor. I'd always wanted to do this. I thank the Lord that when he put that prompting in my mind and said, do it this year, I listened. The last December he was alive, my wife and I took my mom and dad over to Hawaii. We didn't go to do the tourist stuff. I went over there to stand in the street with him where he remembered standing in front of Marine Barracks, which is still there, shooting at those Japanese airplanes. And his unit got a presidential citation because they found one of the planes that had nothing but rifle holes in it from those Marines as they flew over. On December 7, 2002, my dad was allowed two seats out on the USS Arizona for the official memorial service. He took me. I took a picture of him with the commander of all Marines in the Pacific. And my dad was wearing a purple lei all day, which designated him as a survivor. So all the all the Admirals and generals and captains, lieutenants, sergeants, whatever, of any rank, all day long saluted him, Staff Sergeant James R. Glenn, something that had never happened to him before as an enlisted man. And then we found his best friend's grave. This young man and my dad had gone out to see a Charlie Chaplin movie the night before, got their pictures taken with a hula girl, and then the next morning his best friend from basic training was killed on the USS Oklahoma. Now, when you're a kid and your dad tells you these stories, you imagine these big, strong men defending our country. And when we found this young man's grave, it had his birthday and his death day, and he was exactly 17 and a half years old the day he died defending our country. I tell you all that simply to tell you this. It was my father, not just by his words, but by the example of his own life, that taught me to love my country, to be willing to stand up for what I believe in, to be willing to fight for the things I love and believe in. And I believe that all the things you and I were taught by our parents and their parents before them to love about our country, not the land, but the liberty, the unlimited opportunity because we have a limited constitutional government, our strength and security, our Christian values that were the founding of this country are all at imminent risk of being lost from within. I believe if Barack Obama and Debbie Stabenow are re-elected to another term and given the chance to finish the job, they threaten to turn our country into the United Socialist States of America. And we and our children may not ever get a free country back. So why are you sitting here, the same reason I'm standing here, because I feel a duty to do whatever I can as an American, as a dad, as a Christian, to stop them from robbing my children of their birthright. I'm going to be able to pass on to my kids the same free country my dad is willing to risk his life to pass on to me. And don't you want that same opportunity too? And is it not unthinkable as Americans that that may ever be at risk as it is today. If you had imagined a country in the 21st century that would take position, possession of its manufacturing companies, or with Britain and Canada as, as examples of what not to do, would socialize their health care system. Maybe you think of Fidel Castro or Raul Castro in charge now, who seems to be going the opposite way, thankfully, praise the Lord, or that guy down in Venezuela. But who would have ever thought it would be a president of the United States of either party with the support of a senator from Michigan of either party? And yet that's where we found ourselves today. Now, I don't wear either uniform anymore. But when I was an Eagle Scout, I swore an oath to do my best to do my duty to God and my country. And 
about 20 years later, I took another oath and the Persian Gulf War built up to preserve and protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I think the threats to our liberty today are far more severe from within our own ranks than they are from the outside the border. So I feel a duty, I, I still take those oaths seriously. I feel a duty to do whatever I can to stop them from taking my children's birthright away. Now in my case, when I've been taught by life's experiences, that when I do stand up, and fight for what I love and what I believe in, and I can make a difference, then that puts me in a position of feeling compelled to try to do whatever I can to even aspire to go to Washington, D.C., to represent you and the values we share. Let me give you some examples of a record, I think, of leadership and action, which indicates that I don't just talk about what I believe in. First of all, how many of you think Michigan should be America's 23rd right to work state. According to polls, 82% of Republicans in Michigan favor making Michigan a right to work state. I moved to Michigan to Midland in the 90s. In the 1980s, for six years, I was executive director of the Idaho Freedom to Work Committee, which is the organization which successfully lobbied to make Idaho America's 21st right to work state. I ran the campaign. I lobbied it through the legislature. We got 75% support, overrode a Democrat governor's veto. Union officials gathered enough signatures to put it on the ballot, outspent us three to one, and we prevailed nonetheless in November of 1986 on the simple principle that every individual should be free to choose to join or pay dues to a labor union if he wants to, and ought to be equally free to choose not to join or financially support what have now become left-wing, hyper-political labor unions pushing this socialist agenda, and that no Christian or any American should be compelled under threat of being fired to give money to such an organization. I'm a founding member of Michigan Freedom to Work, which is pushing to have that same law introduced in Lansing. We expect it to be introduced sometime, <coughs> perhaps even this month. I encourage you to contact Senator Green and push him to support, because every vote's going to be necessary. And if I'm elected to the United States Senate, I will join Jim DeMint and Rand Paul and Mike Lee and Ron Johnson as a co-sponsor of a national right to work law. Because I believe every American should be free to choose, and they ought to be free to choose in all 50 states. It's a freedom issue. It's a civil rights issue. It prohibits job discrimination on the basis of membership or non-membership, financial support or non-support of a union, just like we already had civil rights laws that prohibit discrimination on the basis of membership or non-membership in a certain race, creed, color, or sex. I think it's also a moral issue. Let me illustrate that this way. How many of you believe marriage is only between, as God ordained, one man and one woman? What's that got to do with right to work? I'll, I'll explain. I've been president of the American Family Association for the last 12 years. We defend Judeo-Christian principles in Lansing in front of city councils all over the state. And probably the most prominent thing I'm associated with in that 12 years is I was one of the two people, along with a law professor at Ave Maria University, who wrote the Marriage Protection Amendment that was on the ballot in 2004. It got 60% of the vote statewide that won in Flint and Saginaw and downtown Detroit. I spoke at African American churches in support of it. Now, I'll tell you, the typical Republican nominee for U.S. Senate is not going to get more than 5% of the vote in Detroit. But I can go back to those same churches, those same pastors, some of whom are like members of my family, one of whom carries my kids' birthdays and names in his wallet, and simply ask for the support from those folks on the basis of where I stand on moral and Christian issues and get more than the average Republican nominee would be able to get, maybe 15% in Detroit, which might make the difference in being able to beat Debbie Stout. But when that was on the ballot, the polls before and after the election said that two-thirds of union households in Michigan voted for it, for the marriage protection amendment. But the Michigan AFL-CIO and the MEA campaigned against it. And after it was enacted by Michigan voters, 
The ACLU filed a lawsuit to try and limit its enforcement, and the plaintiff in that case was a group called Pride at Work, AFL-CIO. It's the union officials' own in-house homosexual activist group. Their logo is a clenched fist under which it says, Proud Union Queer. Can't make it up. Two-thirds of union households in this state, Christian or for whatever the motivation was, voted for the marriage amendment, but were compelled under threat of being fired to give money to union officials who campaigned against that amendment. In my opinion, that's immoral. Not just freedom or civil rights, but a moral issue. Thomas Jefferson, as you know, is not real well known for talking about sin. But he did say this, to compel a man to provide funding for the propagation of opinions he disbelieves is sinful and tyrannical. I agree. And I think it ought to be illegal as well. Not only in Michigan, but throughout the rest of this country. of you believe, as I do, that we ought to repeal, take it off life support, pull the plug, put a stake through its heart, hopefully never be seen again, Obama's socialized medicine scheme. <laughs> well, you can certainly count on me to do that if I'm a United States Senator, but that would just take us back to where we were before. And that system wasn't all that great. So another example of leadership and action, doing more than just talk. Sixteen years ago, as a county commissioner, I authored the nation's first medical savings account health care plan for county employees anywhere in America. Jersey City was the first city, so the mayor of Jersey City and I as a county commissioner were asked to go testify before Congress. And one of the chiefs of staff, or one of the, of the chairman of the House Civil Service Subcommittee, called me in the newspaper a pioneer, national pioneer, in free market health care reform. To illustrate what a medical savings account is, if you don't understand, let me first tell you, here's how most people buy insurance today. Most people have insurance by their employer, or you have it if you're self-employed. But in most cases, if you got a $100 deductible and an 80-20 copay, that may have changed a little bit in some cases, but that's typical. Let's apply that example to the grocery store. Let's say you got food insurance with a $100 deductible and an 80-20 copay, and you go to the grocery store, you want to buy that first $100 worth of food as fast as you can, right? Even if you don't need something, so you can get to the free food. At least free insofar as you only got to pay 20 cents on the dollar on an 80-20 copay. So you rush through that first 100 bucks, you get to the free food, and then you don't care what it costs because somebody else is paying the bill. Problem is, what does the owner of the grocery store do to the price of milk or bread when he knows that you don't care what it costs? Any wonder that health care costs continue to skyrocket when most Americans don't care who's paying for it? And you have Democrats, socialists, proposing that the government should step in for everybody and pay for it. Dick Morris says in his book, Revolt, he thinks that medical savings accounts are the solution to Medicaid funding. I think every federal employee ought to have one. I think our tax code ought to so incentivize as many millions of Americans as possible having a medical savings account. Because here's how that works. You're given a lump sum of money with a high deductible plan, the premium on which is so low because of the higher deductible, maybe even up to $4,000, that you can actually give the employee that much money in their medical savings account to make up for the deductible. Only 10% of Americans would ever use that much health care in any one year. But the key is you tell the holder of the medical savings account that whatever they don't spend, they get to keep tax-free, just like a second retirement account. Now, my wife and I, we practice what we preach since I was running around the country promoting these 15, 16 years ago. We've had a medical savings account, which means we got to go to the doctor. We'll actually call them up and ask them what they charge. You can always tell they're not used to getting that question very much. <laughs> but if we don't restore cost consciousness on the part of healthcare consumers, we're never going to bring down the price of healthcare. We should have as many millions of Americans with an incentive, a 
self-incentive knowing they can keep as much as they don't spend tax-free, that they care what it costs and force the providers of health care to care what they charge and bring down the cost of health care for all Americans. So yeah, I vote to repeal Obamacare, but I would also be a champion for free market health care reform like I was 15, 16 years ago. So whether it was on labor law reform or protecting traditional family values like marriage or health care reform, I've got a track record of experience that has taught me I can make a difference if I fight for what I believe in. That, coupled with that sense of duty and love of my country, compels me to stand up and be a candidate before you and ask your support from the United States Senate. Now, I think the number one statistic that ought to dominate the U.S. Senate campaign in Michigan in 2012 is this. <coughs> Now, I'm one of those guys that roll my eyes every time politicians claim when a small businessman creates jobs, the politician always says, we created jobs. So surely Debbie Stabenow will take responsibility for the fact that in the 10 years she's been in the United States Senate, Michigan has lost 800,000 private sector jobs. Worst job loss in America on her watch. So I've got some specific things I would propose to help Michigan and America create jobs. One we've already talked about, pass a state right to work law, pass a national right to work law. It's not just a freedom, civil rights, moral issue, it is a jobs issue. In that same 10 year time period that we've lost 800,000 jobs which made us the worst in the nation, the bottom five states were losing jobs in the last decade were all compulsory pay up or you're fired union states. The top five were all right-to-work states led by Texas, which had 800,000 new jobs. When Idaho passed it in the 80s, they went from having lost 8% of their manufacturing jobs the previous five years and 30,000 people a year moving out of the state, does that sound familiar? To within 18 months of passing on the ballot in 1986 being number one in the nation in new job creation and in per capita income growth. By the way, the 2010 census found that two-thirds of right-to-work states in this country have higher per capita income than the state of Michigan does. Same thing happened in Oklahoma in 2001. They passed it on the ballot, and within a year, they were number one in the nation in creating new jobs and per capita income growth. If Michigan and America are going to be competitive in a global marketplace, competition from all over the world for where new companies are going to put plant sites, we need to be a right-to-work country. You know how many new auto plants have been built in Michigan in the last 25 years? Mm -hmm. Any guesses? Zero. How many in right-to-work states? Yeah. BMW in South Carolina, Toyota in Tennessee, even GM in Tennessee. And the president of the UAW said in the news conference, the guys on the line down at their Tennessee plant, a right-to-work state, were making higher average hourly wages than the guys in Detroit. Number two. Another way we can create jobs. Drill, baby, drill. Yeah. 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 And I need to explain this word. Frack, baby, frack. <laughs> frack is how you get oil out of the Yale shale oil rock, some of which we have here in Michigan. There is an estimated trillion barrels of oil in the 50 United States. That is more than the other 10 top oil producing countries in the world combined. Why are we dependent on countries that don't like us? Why do we send hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars to countries, some of which would like to blow us up, when we have in our own 50 states more oil than the top 10 of the rest of them combined? Imagine being able to tell Saudi Arabia and Iran to go pound their ample supply of sand. <laughs> While we are energy secure and nationally secure to have our own energy needs met right here in America. And according to Penn State and one consulting firm did studies that said if we would just harvest our own oil reserves, we would create 800,000 American oil and gas jobs. So pass it right to work law. Drill, baby, drill. Number three, cut taxes even more. Cut or eliminate the federal capital gains tax. My son Hunter over here, Hunter James, who's named after his granddad, is a homeschool debate champion. In fact, I think he probably debated with some of the kids in this area. 
And he reminded me, because he had the debate on this topic, that never in the history of America have they ever cut the capital gains tax when the revenues of the government didn't go up. And he said every time they lowered, or excuse me, raised the capital gains tax, the amount of revenue going to the government went down. So reduce or eliminate capital gains tax. Reduce or eliminate the death tax, which just simply means that if you're getting on in years, you own a business, instead of spending it to expand or create new jobs, you start hoarding it, keeping it in the bank so you can leave it to your heirs so they can at least pay the taxes and not have to sell the business once you pass on. You ought to be able to use it to create jobs. Eliminate or reduce, at least, the federal personal income tax and the federal corporate income tax. We also have an estimated trillion, in fact, I heard on Fox News the other day, it's $1.2 trillion American companies have made in other countries that are now sitting in Swiss and Cayman Island bank accounts because they won't bring it back on shore. As soon as they hit the beach, they got to write 35% of it to the federal government. If it was your money, what would you do? When our corporate income tax is more than double the international average of about 15%. Why can't we be like Ireland, which cut theirs to 9% and suddenly became a magnet for corporate relocation and job creation from people all over the world? What would you do with your money? If we want to create jobs, we need to bring that money back on shore to be used to create American jobs. Now, there's all kinds of ways to reform the tax system. I hear people talk about a flat tax would be great because you can write what you earned and then multiply it by 10 or 15% on a postcard and send it in. That'd be better than what we got to do now, wouldn't it? <laughs> it's not as good as I think we could get, though, because whose name is on the other side of that postcard that you're mailing to? The IRS. That's why my favorite is the fair tax, because your tax, whatever you pay, can be collected at the point of a purchase, and we could eliminate, do away with, the most hated and feared federal agency in the United States government, the IRS. <laughs> now, that's, that's great from a tax standpoint, tax reform standpoint. It's great from job creation. The thing I like the most is it takes off your back, always looking over your shoulder, wondering if you screwed up, did you do something right, or are you going to get audited and be guilty until proven innocent? Just to remove that cloud of oppressive restriction on your freedom and peace of mind, I think would be one of the most attractive things, and that's why I like the fair tax. Look it up at fairtax.com. Now I can tell you, and I'm sure you'd agree, when I when I speak to Tea Party groups and to county Republican groups around the state, even the Republican groups nod about this. People are mad at both parties. You agree? Yeah. yeah. Okay, let, let me give you an example. About two months ago, this made me mad. I wonder if it did you. As I watched on TV with this debt ceiling deal, where the Democrats came on TV and whined about how much they were forced to cut spending by this debt ceiling deal. Republicans came on and bragged about how much they forced the Democrats to cut federal spending. All Republicans in Michigan but one, Congressman Dustin Amash, Voted for that debt ceiling deal. But if you live outside that beltway around Washington, if you live out here in the United States in reality, you know there was no cut in sight. All they did was take us from a path of deficit spending that would have left us and our children $10 trillion more in debt. Remember when we used to say billion with a B to make sure people knew we weren't talking about just million? And now we're talking trillion. We were on a path to be $10 trillion more in debt 10 years from now, and these so-called cuts put us on a path to keep spending more than we bring in to the point that we'll be only $7 trillion more dollars in debt 10 years from now. Now, I, I can't help but like what Senator Rand Paul said. He said, if you're going over a cliff at 75 miles an hour, there is no virtue to slowing down to 65 as you go off. <laughs> the result's going to be the same when you hit the bottom. Except by the time the car hits the bottom, it's going to be my son or his son sitting behind the wheel, even though we were responsible for running it off the cliff. We've got to stop that insanity. In fact, Albert Einstein said the definition, you all know this, the definition of insanity 
is to keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. So I want to pose this question to you. Do you think it is rational if we keep sending the same politicians back to Washington of either party who voted for the budgets and bailouts and debt ceiling increases that got us in the mess we're in now, is it rational to keep sending the same people back and expect the fiscal insanity in Washington will end? Is that rational? So let me paint a picture for you. You wake up next November, whatever it is, 2012, it's general election day, and this will be the picture, the choice you face depending on the outcome of the Republican nomination for the United States Senate. You wake up, go to the polling place, and your choice is a Democrat who's been in Congress for 14 years or a Republican who was in Congress for 18 years, both of whom voted for the Wall Street bailout or the stimulus plan. In fact, the Democrat voted for the stimulus plan, not the bailout. The Republican, you have to choose from, voted for the $850 billion TARP Wall Street bailout plan. Both of whom, Democrat and Republican both, from whom you have to choose, voted multiple times to increase the debt ceiling. The Republican to $11 trillion, the Democrat to $14 trillion, the Republican not to $14 trillion only because he wasn't there that year, but said if he had been, he would have voted to make it $14 trillion just like the Democrat. Both of whom voted for outrageous earmarks, bills that had stuff like ACORN funding, and the $223 million bridge to nowhere to that island of 50 people in Alaska. As my wife likes to say, we could have bought each one of those 50 people a million dollar yacht, and it would have saved the taxpayers a lot of money. They could go back and forth on their yacht. Both of them voted for the Brady Bill gun control law. Both of them throughout their political careers have been endorsed and funded by Jimmy Hoffa and the Teamsters Union. Both of whom have long histories of opposing right-to-work legislation at both the state and federal level. The Republican, when running for office, was the only Republican to join Democrats just as recently as last year in answering candidate surveys saying that no, he did not support making Michigan a right-to-work state. And Jimmy Hoffa told ABC News that because of his relationship with the Republican you have to choose from, that that Republican would not be supporting national right-to-work legislation either. Now see if you can wrap your mind around this. Both the Democrat and the Republican in 2007 co-sponsored, along with Senator Barack Obama, H.R. 980, which by federal mandate would have forced every state, county, city, and town in America to unionize all of its police, firefighters, and paramedics. Now, even in Michigan, a strong union state, University of Michigan put out a study a couple months ago in which they quoted local government officials, 70% of which said that their local unit of government here in Michigan is not unionized. And yet this bill, H.R. 980, would have federally mandated that every community in America unionize all of its public safety workers. One of the side effects of that would have been to funnel hundreds of millions of more dollars into the coffers of the SEIU and AFSCME and Teamster Union officials who spend 85% of all the money they spend politically electing Democrats and liberals. Remember, the Democrat and the Republican both voted for these things and co-sponsored these things. And folks, that will be the choice you have next November if you wake up on election day and your only choice is between Debbie Stabenow, the Democrat, and Pete Hoekstra, the Republican. Now, as I talk to Tea Party groups around the state, here's the feeling I get. Maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong. If that's your choice, you might vote for Pete Hoekstra based on some other things rather than see Debbie Stabenow get reelected. But will you work your hearts out yeah. knocking on doors, pounding yard signs, making phone calls for Pete Hoekstra just because he's a Republican? No. Don't no. think so. And in my opinion, any Republican nominee for the United States Senate for whom the Tea Party and other conservative activists will not enthusiastically engage cannot beat Debbie Stabenow and Jimmy Hoffa. We have got to have a Republican nominee instead who shares Tea Party constitutional values, who won't 
don't just talk that way when he's here in Michigan, but will vote that way in the United States Senate. I have volunteered to serve my country once in the past. I volunteer to serve my country again now. And what kind of future would be worth fighting for, for our children? I think you'd agree with me, it's not real complicated, it's not rocket science, it's human nature, it's natural law. The way human beings react, no matter what point in history, no matter where on the planet, to oppression and repression and confiscatory taxation and government looking over their backs and trying to make every decision for them and their families is the same. <coughs> and the way we as human beings react to freedom and opportunity and incentive and reward and moral value is the same. And it was that latter set of values and opportunities on which this country prospered for the first 80% of its existence. So I suggest to you that all we have to do is restore those traditional free enterprise and moral values on which this country was not only an economic powerhouse, but a force for moral good throughout the world, throughout our history. And we can make Michigan and America great again. Now that's the mission I think that's before us. I won't say God bless America, but that would be my prayer, but I think we have to look first and admit maybe we're not worthy of his blessings like we might have once been. So let's say God heal and preserve and protect the United States of America until we can be worthy again of his blessings. And with that prayer on our lips and that job before us, as I said, I ask for your support in the Republican primary for the U.S. Senate. But more important for you, I'm submitting my application for membership to the Tea Party Caucus of the United States Senate. Thank you very much.
where you have, in all 50 states, an imposed law passed in the mid-30s that on all 50 states says, here's how you're going to run your labor relations, and there's only one exemption from federal uh, jurisdiction, and that is whether or not a state chooses to pass a law making it illegal to compel somebody to give money to a union as a condition of employment. A national right to work law would remove 11 words from federal law, wouldn't add a single new word to federal law, it would remove 11 words. The current law federally says every employee shall have the right, free and without fear of penalty, to form, join, and assist a labor organization, comma, or to refrain from any such activity. That sounds pretty good, right? Or to refrain, except there's another comma there. It says, except, or it says, or to refrain from any such activity, comma, except where union membership is required as a condition of employment. <laughs> so they give you this freedom to refrain on the one hand, take it right back after the comma. The only thing a national right to work law does, which I will, if I'm a senator, co-sponsor, is put a period where that next comma is and remove, except where union membership is required as a condition of employment. Then you'd have right to work in all 50 states, and we would protect everybody's freedom of association, as we should. Um, just, a, just a comment. Um, I did some time at uh, General Motors uh, with the UAW, and uh, the um, rationale become irrational uh, against right to life work uh, thinking. And we were just running into it. We were doing a petition for a summer weather group that came off the tour and so forth. And, watch it. and uh, some of the uh, teacher union uh, people were very, very much against the idea that anybody who was right to work person would be, uh, should ever be considered, at least by them, very irrational and, um, you know, uh, it, it's amazing, especially in a manufacturing state like Michigan. I, I guess I don't have much hope that we can overcome it, but I'm not sure hopefully we can. Well, the polls right now indicate that it's about 55-35 among all Michigan citizens in favor of right to work, and the Republicans it's 82% in favor. Uh, so we're hopeful, I mean, goodness. The fact that we even have a shot at passing a right to work law is pretty astounding. Uh, and it would go to a vote of the people after it's been passed by the legislature. They would gather enough signatures to put it on the ballot, so probably in 2014, I think the timing will be. Uh, and then we'll have an Armageddon type fight. I mean, that we'll probably see a quarter of a billion dollars spent between the two sides over that issue. Uh, but just imagine, folks, if compulsory unionism didn't exist in some private organization, stepped up and said, we ought to be able to have the power by law to have you fired from your job if you don't give us money. We'd laugh them out of the public policy or <coughs> Would you be stronger politically if you had the power by law to compel money from the local Democratic Party or the local ACLU for your political activity, even if they disagree with you? Would you be more powerful? Of course you would. And it'd be just as immoral. Uh, it's all about power. You have the, and the only reason the left-wing political agenda stays alive in this country is because of that artificial life support of compulsory dues, the ability to compel even people who disagree with your agenda to give you money, which is still the case in 28 out of the 50 states. We ought to do away with it. Yes, sir. I think I know your stance on the NLRB, so I'd, I'll turn the corner and ask you about um, the AARP, and are they motivated? Eliminate the NLRB. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. And now talk about the AARP and healthcare. Are they motivated to sell insurance? And, and the Department of Energy and other, I, I can go through a whole list of those too, because we gotta cut spending. But the AAR, AARP, um, I had a discussion about this with my mom, uh, who is now 85, I think. By the way, I, I mentioned my dad died. Uh, I, I always envisioned walking my 17-year-old daughter Reagan down the aisle. Uh, <laughs> but I did not envision getting a chance to walk my mom down the aisle, but I did. Uh, a couple of years after my dad died. That was quite an experience. But I had this discussion with her because she'd been approached by AARP. And I found a conservative, traditional values type seniors organization for her. I think it's called uh, seniors.com or something like that. Because the AARP is traditionally a liberal type organization supported Obamacare, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and takes the liberal side of things on just about every question regarding health care. If we want to have a free market health care system, I don't expect to have the support of the AARP, and I would not expect to have their support as a candidate for the U.S. Senate. If 
By the way, I, I would at minimum support Representative Connie Mack's pain plan to actually cut, real cut, real world cut, a penny out of every dollar of federal spending every year. We do that for six years. We have a balanced budget. And I mean by that, we actually spend less this year than we did last year, not one of these fake Washington, D.C. cuts where you only decrease the rate of increase. Uh, but beyond that, just to give you some examples, I'm 53. I graduated from high school in 1976. Anybody in here graduate before I did? Looks like there are a few of you. It looks to me like it turned out okay. I think I turned out okay. Somehow we made it without a federal department of education. There's 50 state departments of education. Why do we need 51? So you can spend money from this county back to Washington, lose some significant percentage of it in the bureaucracy, so that people who've never met your kid can dictate to the principals and teachers and school boards here in this county how we're supposed to educate. We ought to eliminate it. Same thing with the Department of Energy. Same thing with the Environmental Protection Agency. You got 50 state EPAs. Why do we need 51 that won't even cooperate with the state EPA? The NLRB, as I said, number one on my list would be the most hated and feared, the IRS. There's also some of you in here young enough, and the older ones too, you grew up, as I did, maybe practicing how to hide under your desk, like that would help the yeah. nuclear bomb or not. <laughs> you grew up thinking that the Berlin Wall and the Soviet Union were always going to be there. And then because of a president and a pope who believed, they went away. And all of a sudden, they weren't there. Well, the same thing can happen with the IRS. You think it's always going to be there, oppressing, and always hanging over your shoulder. If we reform our tax code in the right way, then we can do away with the IRS. It won't be part of your children's future. Do we have the votes to do it now? Who knows? But we'll never get to 50% plus one if we don't have five first who go out and use the office as a bully pulpit to preach correct principles and call for its abolition and get to 25 and then 45 and eventually 50% 50, 50 plus one. If we fail, so what? I don't think the Lord's going to stand at the gates and ask me what my win-loss record was. He was going to ask me if I was faithful. And we have a duty, regardless of the outcome, to try and save this country and restore the <laughs> I just like to ask, because we're in this society now where it seems like everything's so partisan with Republican and Democrat, how do you get back to the discussion of the issues? Well, I think for the last 45 minutes, that's what I <laughs> I think. I think what I just said in the last 45 minutes, saying we have to stand up to the political culture and the political elite of both parties and focus on constitutional principles, to be willing to stand for those principles, whether a Republican likes it or not, whether a Democrat likes it or not. Folks, as honest as I can be with you from my heart, I don't care about being a two-term senator. I don't care about going back there and becoming buddies and going golfing with people I think are trying to drive my children. Yeah. Yeah. If I was to be so blessed and it's all in God's hands to be a United States senator for Michigan, I'd be happy to be a one-term senator who goes down in history as having tried to save our country. Win, lose, or draw.
And I guess they're happy having all these jobs go locate in other states. We are the third worst in the country right now for young people, 18 to 30, getting out of college and then leaving our state. That's third worst in America. And I met a man uh, uh, about a month ago at a talk I gave, very passionate about right to work, and he explained to me why it was understandable. He said he had seven children and 30 grandchildren. And a year ago, they all lived right here close. But this year, five out of the seven and all the grandkids are gone to some other state to find a job. So he had tears in his eyes talking about how much he supports right to work because it is half the companies in America will not even look at a state that does not have right to work as a potential new plant site. So if we pass that one bill which does not cost Michigan taxpayers any money like all these film incentives and all this other kind of stuff, we would at minimum, they won, double the number of companies around the country and the world that would be willing to at least look at Michigan. Whether or not they'll decide here based on the condition of our roads that they want to move here, or our schools, or tax status, or whatever else, we would at least be able to be on the list of the half of companies in America and around the world that won't even look at a state that does not have right to work. Yes, sir. There's one other issue about the union dues. I think that they ought to pay them out of their pocket instead of having them automatically withdrawn from their paycheck. Couldn't so that they know how much money they're sending to the union. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And in particular, you, as a taxpayer, shouldn't be forced to pay for the cost of government employees having unions. I mean, your local unit of government or school system or the state using your tax dollars to be the bag man for union officials to collect the money at your expense to transfer over to this private organization. No other private organization can go into the unit of government and say, at taxpayers' expense, we want you to withhold from your employees' paycheck money that will come to us. It's time we end this culture of giving unions this unique legal privilege. No other private organization in the country has the privilege of having people fired from their jobs or not giving them money. And that ought to end. But all of, I, I agree wholeheartedly.